And so when Daniel said, you are this head of gold, I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar liked that. He said, that's right. I'm the head of gold. May she last forever. But I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar did not like what Daniel said next. Notice with me verse 39. But after you... What two words, everyone? After you, I'm sure King didn't like this part at all, shall arise another what, everyone? Kingdom, kingdom inferior to yours. Not, not as if that wasn't enough that another kingdom was going to come. He had to throw salt in the wound and say it's going to be an inferior kingdom. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another third kingdom of bronze which shall bear rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. And whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Wow! This dream isn't so hard to understand after all, is it? What he's basically saying is, this image represents a timeline. A what, everyone? A timeline. He says, Babylon is the head of gold, but after you would come another kingdom, and then another kingdom, and then another kingdom, and that kingdom would be divided. All of these kingdoms, by the way, are not just little regional powers, just little regional entities. He says they're another kingdom that would rule over all the world. These were the great nations of antiquity. Now remember that Daniel was written 600 years before the time of Christ. He lived during the time of Babylon. The great Ishtar Gate, which is even now in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, Berlin, this is the very gate that archaeologists have excavated that Daniel would have walked through in our story. That's the very gate that he would have walked through, his heart pitter-pattering, and yet still with confidence as he stood before the most powerful man in the world. That's the gate archaeologists have excavated. It. We'll talk more about that in another session. He says, after you, another kingdom would come. Despite Nebuchadnezzar's desires and despite his hopes and his plans and his ambitions, Babylon did not continue forever and indefinitely. It was eventually conquered by the kingdom of Medo-Persia, which ruled from 539 to 331 B.C. 539 to 331 B.C. It's called the Medo-Persian Empire because it wasn't just the Medes or the Persians. These two nations leagued together to form what historians call the Medo-Persian Empire. In fact, it's really quite a remarkable story. We talked a little bit about it last night. A man by the name of Cyrus the Great diverted the river Euphrates into a field. Babylon was one of the great cities of antiquity. Fifteen miles on each side square. In fact, the walls were 200 feet high in some places. One of the seven wonders of the world was in that city, the great hanging gardens. And the river Euphrates flowed right through the middle of this city of Babylon. It was an awesome city. Cyrus came to that city. The story is told. Historians tell us that they came to the city and they saw those tall walls and they knew there's no way we could ever siege the city. No way we could ever surmount those walls. And so what they did on a certain night when the Babylonians were in a riotous, drunken feast, what Cyrus did in an act of military genius is he went upriver several miles. He dammed the river and diverted the river off into an adjacent field so that downriver, the river went down, 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 down. And then they marched in through the gates underneath the river and Babylon, that great city of antiquity, fell in a single night. He met basically no resistance. God had said that another kingdom would come, and what God says always comes to pass. Can someone say amen? Even the most powerful king in the world cannot resist the decree of God. But a third kingdom would come, a third kingdom of bronze which would rule over all the earth. Which kingdom was it that succeeded the Medo-Persian Empire? Of course, the mighty kingdom of Greece, 331 to 168 B.C. Now, I might get myself into a little trouble here because I'm in the Macedonian Cultural Arts Center, and so I should be perfectly candid and remind us all that Alexander the Great was a Macedonian more than a Greek. The great Macedonian Empire, that'll, that'll get me in good with Goran here. 
ruling from one, or pardon me, from 331 to 168 BC, Alexander the Great was one of the greatest military minds of all time. In fact, Napoleon followed the very battle strategies of Alexander the Great. Arian said in his historical library, book 17, chapter 12, I am persuaded, speaking of Alexander the Great, that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. And notice this next quotation, very interesting. There seems to have been some divine hand presiding over both his birth birth and his actions. Alexander the Great conquered the then known world at the age of 31 years old, but he died in a drunken feast at the age of 32. One of the historians, Hugo, said he could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself. It is said of Alexander the Great that on one occasion he wept because, said he, there was no one left to kill. Alexander the Great prevailed over the great Medo-Persian Empire. History of Rome, Book 3, Chapter 10. On June 22nd, 168 B.C., at the Battle of Pydna, perished the empire of Alexander the Great, 144 years after his death. And so we have the head of gold, Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, and then the bronze or the brass here representing the brass-clad Greeks. That's what Homer called them in his book, The Odyssey. The brass clad Greeks. And God predicted it all long before it came to pass. But who would come after the Greeks? Of course, of course, of course, the great iron monarchy of Rome, ruling not just for a hundred years or 150 years, but from 168 BC. Look at those dates. 168 BC until 476 AD, roughly seven hundred years the great nation of Rome ruled. The iron monarchy of Rome. That's exactly what the Bible had said. Daniel had said, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as what, everyone? Iron. Iron, iron crushes all of the metals. Iron could crush gold. Iron could crush silver. Iron could crush bronze. He said, this kingdom, the long legs of iron, would be a kingdom unlike the others. It would utterly destroy and smash and obliterate the kingdoms before it. The great iron monarchy of Rome. All roads lead to Rome. Rome wasn't built in a... When in Rome do as the Romans. Rome is the greatest empire of antiquity. God foresaw it all. Jesus Christ was nailed to a Roman cross in 31 AD. Jesus Christ was watched by Roman soldiers in 31 AD. Jerusalem was sacked by Roman armies in 70 AD. Rome. Edward Gibbon, the famed English historian, said in his well-known series, The Decline and Fall of the Western Roman Empire, notice what he said. Now, this is a secular historian. In fact, Gibbon was known for his hatred for organized religion, but notice what he says. Look at this imagery. The images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of what? Now let me ask you a question. Where do you think the historian Gibbon got that imagery, gold, silver, brass, and iron, to represent the sweep of history? Where do you think he got it from? He got it from the Bible, and particularly from the book of Daniel. That's exactly right. So this is amazing. The king has a dream, and it's this statue, a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, long legs of iron, and this image is basically a timeline. A what, everyone? Timeline. He said, you're this head of gold. But after you comes another kingdom, and after you another kingdom, and after you the great iron monarchy of Rome. Absolutely fascinating. 600 years before the time of Jesus. God is looking forward and He can declare it perfectly and plainly because God alone knows and can declare the future. Can someone say amen? Well, this raises the question, who conquered ancient Rome? I mean, Medo-Persia conquered Babylon, and Greece conquered Medo-Persia, and Rome conquered Greece, but who conquered Rome? The answer is no one conquered Rome. Rome was not conquered from without. It was divided from within. Notice that. Look in Daniel chapter 2 again. Open your Bibles there. Daniel chapter 2. Notice with me verse 40. Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as what, everyone? Iron. iron. Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. But notice verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be what? 
God said 600 years before the time of Jesus, the kingdom will be what everyone? Divided. And the kingdom was? Divided. That's exactly right. The kingdom was divided. And that's what's represented by the feet partly of iron and partly of clay, partly strong and partly weak. The kingdom will be divided, and that's the day we're living in right now. Divided Rome, or the so-called nations of Europe. Europe today is essentially divided Rome from 476 A.D. to the present tense. There is nothing below the statue. It's just head, arms and chest, belly and thighs, long legs and the feet. That's it. You don't got anything else after your toes. Partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. The kingdom will be divided. Here's a chart that depicts the invasions and fragmenting of Rome that began in 100, uh, uh, 100 A.D. They say here C.E., which is the common era. That's fine. And, and the fragmentation, the vandals moving up from, from the north of Africa and the Saxons, of course, up there in England. And all of these barbarian tribes begin to basically pick Rome apart at the seams until eventually, as my dad used to say to me, you're getting too big for your britches, boy, and it fell apart. That's history. That's history. 